This is Dermatology Weekly. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. Dermatology News is 50 years old in 2020, and throughout this year, we've been giving you special interviews and lookbacks for our 50th anniversary. In this special edition of Dermatology Weekly, Dr. Leslie Bauman guest hosts, and she interviews her idol. Dermatology News will be back in episode 86 with the latest in the goings on in the world of dermatology. Don't forget, you can email the show at podcasts at mdedge.com. You can follow us on Twitter at mdedgederm. If you have any ideas or guests or people that we should discuss for our 50th anniversary or for a normal episode of Peer to Peer, feel free to let us know via Twitter or in our email. Okay, without any further ado, please welcome our guest host, Dr. Leslie Bauman. Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Bauman, and my guest is my idol, Dr. Jim Layden, and I'm sure you already know who he is. He was at um, University of Pennsylvania for many years, and um, I wanted him to be my first guest because for years I've been wanting to do a podcast with him. He has so many amazing stories, so thanks, Dr. Layden, for being with us today. Uh, It should be fun. It'll be fun. So um, over the years, you've told me so many great stories, and um, you were very involved in the history of getting Retin-A approved, and you worked with Albert Kligman. So um, tell me, like, back early on, how did you get interested in doing research on skincare? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when I was a fourth-year medical student at Penn, I was a science sealed and delivered neurologist. The head of neurology was a brilliant, charismatic uh, individual. And actually, uh, my class of 120, I think, there were 10 neurologists, mainly because of this this guy. So I, I already had my residency in neurology, and I was starting a research project with the uh, late, great Britain Chance. And the project, he had the idea that uh, nuclear magnetic resonance could be leveraged to image the brain. That's the basis of MRI. So that's the project I was working on, and and that's what I was going to do. And I wanted to take an elective. There was this new field in uh, radiology called neuroradiology. Believe it or not, when I was a medical student, there wasn't a field. There was a small handful of people in the country, and one of them was at Penn. It was a half a day elective, and the only other elective I could get to match it was dermatology, uh, and I tried very hard to get out of it. <laughs> I didn't want to, the last thing I wanted to do was to do an elective. Uh, the only thing I, I would have taken it above was uh, uh, psychiatry or obstetrics. Those were the two fields that I absolutely wouldn't even walk into a clinic. Uh, and finally, after trying and trying, they, they, they said, look, either you do this or you got to do something else because there is no other way. So I did it, and I, I basically went around with George Hambrick. He was still at Penn before he went to take over the program at Hopkins. Uh, and the Thursday, our weekly conferences that were, were electric. I mean, there were some some of the best known dermatologists in the world were in that room, and Albert Kleeman was dominating the discussion on every single patient. And it, it was it was clear to me that. Uh, they didn't know very much <laughs> about skin disease, but they sure were passionate about it. And Cleveland was was amazing. So I I took another elective. I took a full day elective and spent time with Cleveland. And at the end, I, I decided I, I said I want to work with you. You know, I want I want to work with you. And he said, Well, you know, we got this new guy here, Dick Marples, whose mother, Mary Marples, was the mother of cutaneous microbiology. Wrote the classic textbook. He's, he's coming here, and uh, uh, maybe, and we have a training grant, you know, he says, so you, you wouldn't have to be like a regular resident doing all the nonsense that residents have to do. Uh, and, and maybe you could be the one who figures out where antibiotics work and why they work. There was a lot of, you know, observational kind of stuff that antibiotics worked in atopic dermatitis, for example, even when it wasn't infected clinically. And that it worked in acne, but it didn't seem to work in psoriasis. Although some people thought maybe it did, and there was all this discussion. He said, and "We've just developed a technique, a, a quantitative uh, technique for skin bacteria, and uh, you, you could 
work with Dick and, and, and me, and we'll, we'll try and sort this stuff out. So I said, I'm in. Well, that created a big problem for me when the, I had to go talk to the head of medicine. You know, what are you doing? You can't do this. You know, you're going to be a neurologist. You're going to work with Britain Chance. What do you, you know, we can get you help. <laughs> you know, you just can't throw your career away. And I said, well, you know, uh, Yogi Berra said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. So I'm taking it. I'm going, I'm going with Albert Clayton. And then, uh, Incredibly, the guy who seduced me into neurology died a year later from a heart attack. And it took 15 years to figure out how to get MRI. So I would have wasted 15 years. <laughs> and, uh, so I started uh, working with Albert, who of course is an unbelievable uh, bundle of energy. I asked him once, I said, where do you get, how do you, where do you get this energy? And, you know, he says, I, I'll tell you, he says, I got to know everything about skin, how it works, and what's wrong with skin disease before I die. I just got to know it all. Uh, so he also invented the horizontal uh, uh, time schedule. You know, he, he, we worked at multiple projects at the same time. And we discussed something in the morning, and at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, he said, well, how's it going? So we just we didn't start yet. You know, you're, you're wasting your life. Uh, so... Uh, he single-handedly disrupted the entire field. I mean, he, he challenged, there were, you can't imagine, you know, people of your generation have no idea of the nonsense that people thought was reality uh, back in those days. And he, he just went into every single field there was. There was no field that he wasn't in. Uh, and uh, he made absolutely uh, important contributions in all of them. He attracted all kinds of people. At one point, when we had a fresh shift that I, I was writing the introduction for, there were 30 professors of dermatology who had been Klugman fellows. Uh, so he attracted a lot of people from uh, around the world, and it, it was it was an absolutely uh, unbelievably exciting place to be. I mean, you could, I just I couldn't wait to get there every morning, you know, and I didn't want to go home at night, you know, because. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something thrilling about discovery and working with a, with a mind like that. So one of the things you want to talk about is the retinoid story. And uh, that was one of the very first projects uh, that he got me involved in. And Gerd Playwake, who I'm sure you know uh, from Germany, he's a, a, a master of acne in, uh, in Europe, uh, was also a fellow with me at the same time that I was on this NIH uh, training grant with Dick Marcus. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was just, uh, an exciting time when he became aware of what was going on in Hoffman LaRoche. There was a basic scientist, uh, Boline was his name, who was interested in, in cancer, two-stage chemical carcinogenesis. And tretinoin, known in those days as vitamin A acid, were all trans retinoic acid, had been discovered. Uh, to have effect on abnormally differentiating epithelial cells, but it could redirect it towards more normal uh, differentiation if it wasn't too far down the path of abnormal, eventually, carcinogenesis. Uh, and uh, so he had, had done some uh, seminal work in that area, and they, Roche decided to see if it had any effect in skin disease. So they collaborated with the major program in, in Berlin and the uh, clinician that did the work was a great guy named uh, Stuckton. And they reported some early results in ichthyosis, Barrier's disease, uh, and then Roche took out a, a patent and they said it worked in this and it worked in that. And it, the only thing it didn't work in was acne. <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember Albert saying, said, you know, this guy Stuckton works with a guy named Orfanos. He said, as far as I'm concerned, Orfanos has never been right about anything. He said, we're going to look at this molecule in acne. Uh, so we, we started an acne play. And it's an amazing story. But, uh, and, and we got this stuff. You know, one of the stuffs was turned out to be tretinoin or retinoic acid. 
And just by chance, purely by chance, the alcohol solution was, was in uh, dark bottles. Now, at that point, nobody knew that that molecule was photolabile. Didn't you tell me that they were clear bottles first and it didn't no, work? No, it was, it was the dark bottles first. Oh, and, okay. And even though the, it was an alcohol solution that was fairly irritating and a lot of people couldn't tolerate, those who could, we thought, you know, Gert and I, like beginners, you know, we were in like our second month and we say, hey, this stuff works. Uh, and uh, we had pictures, you know, we had all kinds of pictures with half a face treated and it was crystal clear that this molecule was so much different than the junk we had back in those days. Uh, and then all of a sudden it stopped working. <laughs> you know, and then we, we kind of said, it doesn't work anymore. And, and, and you know, I like said, you guys are killing me. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? I just applied for a, 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 you know, a patent for the department on this thing. And you, now you're telling me it doesn't work. Well, it took about six months and we finally figured out it was, now it was in uh, clear bottles. That was the problem. Yeah. Some simple experiments you could show that. You know, the, so the, the light was inactivating and that's why it didn't work. Yeah. And it's why it stopped working, right? So it got. How did you figure that out, though? Well, well, uh, uh, I think Gerd was the one, or maybe it was Jim. For one of somebody said, maybe, maybe uh, it's because these bottles are clear. Maybe it has some. <laughs> maybe light has some effect on it. And, and once you did the experiment, it was crystal clear that you know it was photolabile. So, so it, it, uh, then. then uh, <laughs> This is only Albert that uh, you know could do this. The, the university lawyers completely botched the uh, patent process. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, completely botched. The patent was turned down. Turned down. <laughs> you know, and so uh, I remember Albert saying, "Said he said that tomorrow you know, when it, that happened, he said you and I are going to New York and we're going to find the smartest patent lawyers we can find, and and and, and he paid for it himself." And, and of course, we they got the patent. The drug the drug got launched. It was not a success initially because it was an alcohol solution. It was in those days nobody knew how to uh, formulate something like tretinoin. It was too too difficult to work with. And uh, there were some people who used it, but most people said this stuff is you know this is ridiculous. Uh, and it was a, it took a long time, and it wasn't until the oral retinol. Uh, started to become a reality that people said, well, maybe we need to relook at this. And, and Johnson and Johnson by that time had learned how to formulate it in gels and creams, which were much more easily tolerated, although they still had an irritation potential. And the, uh, the oral retinoid story was that there, because of this intense interest in the uh, potential use in the carcinogenesis, there was a guy at the NIH, uh, Michael Sporn, who had it developed an organ culture uh, system. And uh, Hoffman and Roche would, would synthesize all kinds of molecules. So they would send them to him, and he would put them in his system. And he found that the 13 cis isomer of retinoic uh, acid was, had real effect. So that led to uh, experiments in, in humans at the NIH with Gary Peck was the uh, clinician at the NIH. He came up uh, to give a, a seminar at our place about his findings in ichthyosis and Darius. I mean, they had people with Darius disease that were just unbelievable. And ichthyosis, who it clearly, this molecule clearly was beneficial. And at the end of his uh, Symposium. I was on one side of the room and Albert was on the other. We both said, Well, what'd you find in acne? And he said, Why should we look at it in acne? And he said, Wait, what did he say? He Pat, said, Gary Peck said, Why should we look at it in acne? Oh, wow. Disorder of gratinization. Well, we had, a, we had a concept in those days which turned out not to be accurate. We thought the non inflammatory region of acne, the comedo, was an abnormal, uh, abnormal cell differentiation, abnormal gratification process. So that, that's what we thought uh, it might be, uh, and so we, so uh, Albert said uh, to Gary, he said, uh, "Jim will explain it to you." <laughs> you know? So I said, "Well, Gary, you know." So Gary Peck went back and uh, treated ten people, and in collaboration with John Strauss, uh, uh, showed incredible 
benefit. And that's how uh, Accutane got started. And shortly after that, he tried to name So that led people uh, in the pharmaceutical world to think, well, maybe this set of molecules has some benefit. And by then, receptors had been discovered, uh, right? No, receptors. So that led to adapalene and then to xerotene uh, being developed. So all of this would never have happened except Poitman said that Orphanos was never right. <laughs> so we're going to study <laughs> it in acne. And it would never have happened if they had been put in clear bottles, because it wouldn't have worked. And we would have said, well, our finals was finally right, you know. And it's that the whole thing, you know, just kind of was meant to be, I guess, because it, there were too many things that sh should have stopped the whole thing. And clearly, I think you can put retinoids up there with antibiotics, antifungals, you know, corticosteroids as major uh, form of uh, Ecological developments in our field. At what point did um, you all start noticing that wrinkles got better? I always tell my patients. Well, no, it wasn't wrinkles. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. what uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was in the early '80s. Uh, uh, Albert said, "You know, we, we, you know, he was he was actually getting annoyed at the cosmetic industry. You know, if they were selling this stuff." And he said, you know, we, we, we got to learn something about what really works. And so we started uh, something that we called initially the, our, the Aging Skin Clinic, which was, which was kind of fun because people who wanted to come would, uh, you know, whisper to the, you know, could you tell me where the Aging Skin Clinic is? <laughs> Why they were there. And so, uh, and, and he said, we're going we're gonna to look at, uh, uh, tretinoin, and the reason was uh, one of the side effects, as you know, uh, everybody gets to it, uh, that when you use tretinoin in, in pigmented people, <clears throat> their skin often gets lighter. You know, and so that was a side effect, and it's in the package insert. Uh, the package insert for for retin A, I actually wrote. <laughs> Can you imagine back in those days? You know. Uh, and a fellow was writing it for the FDA. I mean, that FDA people <laughs> would think that was uh, maybe uh, bizarre at best. Uh, uh, so w one day we were talking about it, and uh, the light bulb went on. You know, like, well, you know, uh, this side effect is a wanted effect for people who have abnormal pigmentation from chronic uh, uh, UV damage. So that's what led us. We went into the clinic to, to try and see how much we could verify in this form of that pigmentation of benefit. And in the process of that, patients were telling us that they thought they had less wrinkles, which we, of course, discounted. He said, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so you, you were doing the Kligman formula studies around that time, and then patients. Well, that, that's another. That's another offset. We, we we went in there. We, we went in there uh, with the idea that we were going to see if we could make solar light to goes, etc. Model this pigmentation better, uh, and at the same time, uh, as we were doing that, as we observed what we thought clearly was improvement. Uh, that's when Albert got the idea, well, maybe if we mix it with, uh, you know, with a steroid, which has a substantial effect on pigmentation, uh, and the tretinoin uh, would, it would uh, block some of the side effects of steroids on the skin. So we were doing this in the typical uh, horizontal priority uh, schedule that Albert was so fond of. We were doing multiple things. At the same time, and then patients started telling us Facebook they were less wrinkled. So then we developed a technique to quantify some changes in wrinkling uh, with using uh, silicone replicas, and we became convinced that what they thought they were saying, you know, was true. And that's how that uh, really got extended into that that field. I didn't realize that you guys developed the silicone uh, model for wrinkles. If that's still used today. Yeah, it's just a good model. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I had no idea that was you guys. Yeah, that was uh, 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 the person who did most of that was Gary Grove, who was in our group. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it all it was all you know very 
very, uh, you know, when people every once in a while still ask me, are you still working? You know, and I say, you know, I never worked. I said, <laughs> never worked. I said, I never had to do something. You know, I, I couldn't wait to get there because we were doing so many things that was so interesting that <clears throat> I did, the last thing I would consider was work. Right here, Al Kligman was an amazing, amazing guy. You know, I've never asked you this question. I've always wondered, how did it come about that retinol is over the counter and retinoids are prescription? Uh, um, well, <coughs> the reason is retinol has been in, in a lot of products, including cosmetics, for a long time as an, uh, for its antioxidant uh, properties. So it was already in over-the-counter products. So oh. how... So, and then as, as it became apparent in, in, in the work of uh, Seiwon Kang and John Voorhees, where they showed retinol was a pre drug of retinoic acid, uh, <clears throat> that once we became aware of all that, then obviously retinol might have some, some benefit. And it, it clearly does. And uh, there, there are many, many good, really good studies that show that's definite benefit. So the FDA couldn't say, well, we can't allow this over the counter because it's already there, you know, and, and for another uh, reason, just in a different concentration. One of the, one of the big advances was right, a very unstable product, uh, chemical, and it, it was basically uh, Avon and uh, Johnson & Johnson, who both did sort of independently and pretty much at the same time figured out how to stabilize it. So you could up the concentration a little bit and not have it disappear before you can get it on the shelf and out to a consumer. All right. And I remember when they came out with that micro sponge technology, that was a big deal at the time too. It was, it was a complete uh, fraud. It was? Yeah. You always uh, know yeah, they, they said, you're going to have a, let, 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 yes, let me tell you that story. <laughs> uh, the micro sponge, see, you're old enough to say micro sponge. Uh, oh, does that age Maybe I'll never say that again. <laughs> because residents today don't think this. What do you mean, micro sponge? They say <laughs> micro sphere. Because, and that's where the questionable is. Uh, when when they first introduced it as the micro sponge, dermatologists said, "Don't sponges have holes in it? Doesn't the stuff leak out?" The answer is, it, it all leaks out. Ninety-five plus percent is not inside the sponge. So how did it ever get approved? I still to this day can't believe this, but this is what happened. I got a call like the, uh, the last week in October from a comp somebody in the company that makes the, made the micro sponge. So we need you to do a study now. <laughs> and it's got to be finished by the end of uh, November. Because in those days, the academy was always the first week in December. Because we're going to meet with Johnson & Johnson and this is going to be their big project coming up. And I said, well, what, I, what do you want? He said, we want you to recruit uh, uh, 25 it or more people with very sensitive skin, and we want you to treat them in a blinded fashion in the laboratory every day, one side of the face, tretinone, the other side, tretinone, microsponge, and see if, how much difference there is or isn't. Well, at the end of the first week, it was very clear in most of these people that one side was peeling and or had some redness. That, that turned out to be tretinone. The other side was still and felt fine. That turned out to be the micro sponge. At the end of the three-week study, all 25 people were irritated on both sides. Right? So I thought that, well, that's, this is not very useful. <laughs> you know, one week of no irritation. Uh, the FDA thought that was a sensational finding. <laughs> and, uh, I say, I over, you know, I that's all I could do not to uh, say, what are you talking about? Because I was there, you know, as a consultant for Johnson and Johnson. But I thought, I said, they'll never approve this. You know, this is nonsense, and they did. Um, so the micro sponge success is because they kept lowering the concentration. You know, they got, they got down to the lower and lower concentrations. And as, as you know, a lot of dermatologists still don't know, but most people, there are people who can't tolerate tretinone very well. We know who they are pretty much nowadays. 
Um, but there was such a widespread, you know, uh, understanding that tretinoin was very irritating. That when when Galderma came out with the dapoline, they very wisely named it different because it was different. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and they different. said it was non-irritating. Of course, in their own, uh, they, they promoted it as non-irritating. And if you look at the original uh, phase three study results, forty percent of people were irritated. But that was a detail they thought dermatologists didn't need to know. Well, uh, I tell people if you're not irritated, if the retinoid doesn't irritate you, it doesn't work. Do you think that that's correct? Like anything that binds? No, that, you know, I don't. I don't. I, no. <laughs> Tell me why that, why? I think, I think if you can, uh, <clears throat> because you can clearly, uh, I did a huge, huge study years ago that I have yet to meet anybody who ever read it, where we looked at the irritation potential of different retinoids, different concentrations, different vehicles. And I, I could get a panel. I, I, what I learned was the irritation was a, a factor of stratum corneum integrity. And thickness, uh, uh, that was the single most important thing, more so than the molecule. So, for example, I I, I could get I got a panel of 25 people who could tolerate tizaritine twice a day without a hint of irritation. Wow! And a panel of 25 people, none of whom could last more than a week or two with with the lowest concentration of the that one. So it's wow. the first and more, more, more than the molecule. So plenty of people can uh, get profound effects without irritation, but, but there's a definite irritation. <clears throat> and I think what we what we proposed and the way we presented was, you know, you should like get tiptoe up to the irritation level and then back off, and keep keep pushing it because the the closer you get to irritation, benefit without irritation. But if you get up to the irritation point, then you're going to get the maximum benefit you can get as a person. Right. Well, I always tell people that your moisturizers and your cleansers that you use with retinoids are key, but, and that must be oh, what yeah. thing oh, is yeah. the point. But what I meant is if you, you know, some of these over-the-counter creams that or the uh, cosmeceuticals that say, we're a non-irritating retinoid, most of the time those are retinaldehyde or a retinol ester or something that doesn't even really It doesn't really have any work, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the secret with retinol is it's a prodrug. Uh, the cosmetic industry doesn't like that word, but it is a, is a pro molecule, if you will, that uh, the skin actually converts into, into the acid form. Right. And then once you told me a story about, because everybody thinks retinoids, topical retinoids make you photosensitive. And I get asked that at least every week in my clinic, people will say, oh, I can't use tretinoin because I like to run in the sun. Yeah, well, uh, Christ Sky being our photobiologist in our group did the study to show that uh, it, it increases the MED by you know, like one or two, something like that. It's not, and it's not a photosensitizer in the sense that it's a, it, inducing either an immunologic photoallergic reaction. It's not phototoxic. And what it does do is it thins the stratum corneum and smooths the stratum corneum, so it has a focusing effect. Of, there's less light scattered, and that so there is a change in the MED, but it's not it's not phototoxic, not photosensitization, and uh, it's a, a minimal effect. But, but didn't you once tell me that you guys thought for a while it did make you photosensitive, and then that person had um, uh, poly, the oh I'm just blanking on the name of when you're sensitive to light polymorphous light eruption. Polymorphous light, yeah, yeah. I have a I I have polymorphous light. Eruption myself. Uh, I no. I it, there was a lot of a lot of question about whether it was a photosensitizer because you know in our specialty we still I think suffer although less and less from people. If you say something and you sound convinced convincing and you say it enough, then people will assume it must have been proven. <laughs> uh, and, and there was a lot a lot of that back in the day. Mm-hmm. Less and less of a portion of these things. Well, I still think everyone should be on a retinoid, even if they're running in the sun, because it has so many good protective effects. Uh, but I have another question I've never asked you. How in the world did they end up with isopropyl mirror state in an acne topical cream? Did we not know at that time that that was comedogenic or, you know? <clears throat> but, 
Well, uh, let me let me tell you what I think about that story. The the original uh, paper on the on the adverse effect of ingredients in cosmetics. My name's not on it. On that that rabbit ear comedogenic study, or which not one? The, ra the rabbit ear rabbit. Rabbit ear is a useful model that's much, much, much more sensitive uh, than the human. For example, there are there are concentrations of tretinoin that work extremely well in the rabbit ear model of inducing comedones that have no effect on human skin. So it's a it's a very sensitive molecule in, uh, uh, system in terms of both induction of abnormal things like comedones as well as reversing it. So I I. I was very much opposed to the concept that uh, that this and that, like isopropyl myristate, was, became like a poison. <laughs> you know, thou shalt not put isopropyl myristate near the skin of the person with acne. Uh, I, I totally disagreed with it because of the sensitivity of the molecule. It, it was never really shown in humans. It was shown in the rat. And, and, and it... it, it the level of induction in the rabbit was, there was a difference that didn't matter, in my opinion. But others in our group disagreed, and they said, well, you know, you want to be on this paper? And I said, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Huh, well, okay, so you th you don't think isopropyl myristate is comedogenic. How about coconut oil? What do you think about that? That's another controversial one I hear a lot. Well, I, I don't... Really, I don't really remember the coconut oil being tested in the rabbit ear model. If you could, if you can do in the rabbit ear what you can do with coal tar, which is the quintessential induction molecule that is used to look for benefit of things like retinoids, if you can do what coal tar does, then I clearly would. And, and what things you know, the agents that cause chloracne, they, they make the rabbit ear, you know, one big mass of combinations. If you can do that, where we know there is a human counterpart, then I believe it. But if you do something that produces a histological slight increase in stuff, I, I said, I, you know, this, I don't think this necessarily, maybe it means something in humans, but it'd be nice to prove it. Right. And, uh, so it's never really shown that that level of change in the rabbit ear correlated with something in humans, the way the chloracne agents clearly do both. But the, what they do in the rabbit ear is light years more in, mm -hmm. than, than what something like isopropyl bursted. And I don't, I don't know about something going on. Another question I always get asked, and I, I never really know how to answer this because, you know, I'm a huge retinoid fan, is that big, huge study that was done through the VA where they showed people on retinoids for a long period of time had a higher risk of cancers. Is What, how do, what do you think about that? Not much. <laughs> I don't either, but how do we tell the audience that when we get asked a question? Well, I, I don't, you know, there are all kinds of levels of what constitute uh, epidemiologic uh, proof, I guess, is a good enough word. Uh, and you know, the, that's not, it's not really been shown in that we all, we know that it has anti-cancer properties in terms of reversing things that are on the path from normal to cell differentiation to the most abnormal cell differentiation, which we call cancer. So when you know there's a, I mean, the literature and the level of science in that area is is, is astounding, and then you have like. Uh, you know, a retrospective study saying maybe there's an association it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a causality involved. So, and and in in my uh, what I one of the things I learned from Albert is that all results are are at most interesting until they are replicated. You know that just because somebody says something or shows thinks they've shown something. Uh, is uh, yeah, you know uh, this uh, uh, so just because something is published or something says somebody says something or whatever I, I so I I still tell our residents I said don't believe a word any of us tell you 
you know, check it out yourself, especially me. Don't believe anything I say. Unless, and I'll tell you, you know, why I say things. And, and, what, and, and you can look them up and see what you think and see what you think the level of evidence is. And, you know, that's one of the things you've taught me over the years is to question everything. And I always ask you these very simple questions like, why do they call it a closed comedone? And I'm embarrassed to oh, ask you that because it sounds so obvious. And then you come back and you say, they misnamed it. And it makes me so happy that I asked. <laughs> well, it's true. If you, got, you, have to, you have to question things or you pretty soon you believe the nonsense you tell patients. It actually is true, you know. Yeah, everybody has to come up with a way of explaining things. But if you explain it often enough and, and, and nobody challenges it in terms of what it, then pretty soon you think it's true. Right. The other day someone told me a great quote that they said, science is written in sand. And yeah. I love that. Isn't that a great quote? <laughs> yeah, yeah right. you better read it quickly. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just disappearing, yeah. But I right. used to say, you say, you know, if, if – uh, 20% of what you say when you're 30 is still true when you're 60. You had a hell of a career. 20%? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. Because it, it just, you know, uh, the word research means to look again. And at the more you look, the more you see, and the more, uh, you know, the more, the more you learn. You know, one of the things that, uh, that when Albert said, uh, let's see if we can figure out, what's going on here. One of the things we did was a whole series of things in diaper rash. Now, you you, you never heard of this because you're too young, but uh, when I was a, a resident, diaper rash was due to ammonia, and there were treatments. Believe it or not, babies were put on cranberry juice. Cranberry juice was a preventative for diaper rash. Of course, nonsense. Uh, and, the, and the rationale for it was to minimize the release of ammonia uh, you know, in the diaper area, and it, it, you can smell the ammonia in the diaper. Area. It turns out ammonia is not has nothing to do with diaper rash. And what we what we proposed was diaper rash was due to wet skin. Wet skin is more easily irritated by frictional forces, and that was the basis for the super absorbing diapers that now, uh, you know, most uh, babies use. And diaper rash is not a problem, other than antibiotic induced candida. Right. Well, I'm looking at your scan. I can't believe you're 80. Obviously, the retinoids work. Even People... can I. Even can I. <laughs> yeah, you, you look amazing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, and you live on, and, and our family always talks about you because um, you always taught me that to say hypothesis instead of a theory. So it drives yeah. my family crazy because they'll say, I have a theory, and I'll go, no, 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 it's a hypothesis. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I... Uh, uh, one of the reasons you're so respected in our field is because you've always been honest and stuck with the truth and no company never paid you to say things that you didn't believe and all of that. And I've always respected you. Years ago, I read this book called Going to the Top. I think I was in my 20s. And it said that you should, before you spend all these years building your career, you should look around and see different people in positions that you're interested in and get to know them and uh, see what they like about their career, what they don't like about their career. And then when you find the person that is, you know, who you, who you want to be, model them yourself after them. And I always model myself after you because I think uh, what you've done with your career is amazing. You've, you've um, done a lot with acne and, and all kinds of general derm things, but you've also done a lot in the cosmetic dermatology world. And you never once tarnished your reputation. You never crossed that line. And I, 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 I actually got offered I'll tell you, I don't know if I ever told you this story. In 1980, uh, when Ronald Reagan became president, and one of the things he said he was going to do was to stop the regulation process. And one of the areas he thought it was silly to regulate was cosmetics. So a very prominent uh, cosmetic company decided they were going to run with this that they were going to start making claims without doing anything, just make the claims. And if they got, uh, if they got sued, then they just stop that claim and make a more outrageous claim. So they wanted to know if I would be willing to be involved. So we were having dinner in a 
wonderful restaurant in Philadelphia, and they, and they told me they're playing. And I said, well, uh, well no, uh, uh, that would cost a lot for me to do that. And they said, well, how much would you need? And I said, well, $20 million for the first year. And they said, well, yeah, that's absurd. You, you, you know, and I said, well, then we don't have to talk about this anymore? Uh, pass me the wine list, please. You know, <laughs> and that's the last I ever heard of it. But that, you know, so if you're going to, if you're for sale, you better get a lot. <laughs> because it, uh, you, you get discovered, you know, and once you're discovered, that's it. What, what would your advice be for a younger dermatologist starting out? Because it seems like more and more people are kind of crossing that line. It drives me crazy when people come out with a skincare line that they claim they invented, and it's just the same stuff they, that they're they wouldn't know what They wouldn't know what's in any of the products or how they're formulated. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know. If you don't have a personal compass that you don't tell lies, <laughs> you know, that, uh, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know how you help somebody like that. If you, if you, if you really want to do something like that, you have to do the work to become capable enough to, to maybe do develop something. You know, it's it's useful. And then, how did one more quick question? How did um, you and Dr. Kligman come up with the word cosmeceutical? What setting did oh, that? that was that was an Albert. He was great at. Uh, he was the master of language. Uh, that was his. That was his word. It's a great word. Was, Did I ever tell you my story about sitting next to him at a dinner party? I remember the dinner party. Yeah, I remember. I wanted to sit by him, and there was going to be three hundred people there. I wasn't going to go unless I got to sit by him. And I introduced myself. I sit by him. And I'm like, "Hi, Dr. Kligman. I'm Dr. Bauman. You know, I I write this column and um, cosmeceuticals, and I'm a big fan of yours." And he turns to me and he goes. I'm going to leave out the dirty words, but he goes, get over yourself. <laughs> I'll never forget. I was so shocked. And then I had to sit by him the whole rest of the dinner party. Well, but it didn't matter because I, I liked him so much. And then when my skin type solution book came out, he read every page and edited it and put comments and mailed it to me. And I mean, I was so flattered. I still have that in my collection. Well, you know, he was, uh, uh, he, Really interesting. One of the things he did like, at, at the SID, people were, you know, young investigators were always terrified that Cleveland would attack them. You know, he'd get up and rant and rave. And, uh, but what people don't know is that he commonly would send notes to people. You know, he said, I said, you know, saw his paper, it was terrific. Uh, he'd make some comments. And if you're ever in, want to come visit, please come. People save those letters, you know, because uh, uh, he was he was very, very generous. Uh, Nardo Zayas, you know Nardo. You, yeah, he's in uh, Miami. Uh -huh. uh, Nardo, I remember, Nardo came to visit Clinton because he said he was interested in nails. And Maybe he has some advice because Clayton, that was, of course, one of the many areas that Albert had made contributions. And Albert says, so we, we went into a room, and he got two big boxes of photomicrographs of biopsies of lichen planus, psoriasis. He said, here's what I've done. He said, you know, take what you want. So Nardo came up, spent some time with Albert, and then his whole career. <laughs> it was Albert gave him his career in a couple of boxes that he took home with him. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Well, I think enormously generous person. It sounds like Kligman is the reason you went into what into dermatology and did what you did, and oh, um, no, yeah, and you're the reason I've done what I've done in a lot of ways. And thank you for that. And I, I just think for the listeners, you need to find a good, reputable mentor who isn't afraid to tell you the truth. I can't tell you how many times Dr. Layden has told me I was didn't know what I was talking about and corrected me. And I'm very grateful for it because that makes you better. So I hope everyone can find a, a good mentor. Do you have any closing words for people? And thank you so uh, much for doing this. Of all the amazing things you've done in your career, is there any one thing that you're most proud of? Uh, I, 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 when people say, what do you think 
you know, what's the best thing you ever involved in? Was it Accutane or what, acne in general? I actually think the thing that I often say is I think the work we did in diaper rash that led to the clear demonstration that diaper rash was a wet skin problem that led to the development of the Kimberly Clark and uh, Vodka and Gamble diapers. You know, you, uh, diaper rash was a horrible, horrible thing. You know, I, when I started use it, it was, it was, it was bad. Uh, and now diaper rash is like a minor issue. Uh, I, I think that those, those studies, uh, and it used to be told that, you know, you, sh you can't use cornstarch on a baby because cornstarch will make the baby get candid. And so we showed that candid it can't utilize cornstarch. You know, cornmeal is a much more enriched uh, version of corn that is used in cultures to facilitate candid growth. But uh, so we, we, we completely got rid of all kinds of nonsense and and found what really was the problem and the problem is now not a problem. That's amazing. That's yeah, a good one. So I think I didn't realize that, that was that, that was uh, that was like a ten year worth of work that really ended up making a huge difference. And then well, and then isotretinol of course is another Changing. Of course. Well, thanks for all your contributions and your um, demonstration to people that they should be humble. It's always surprising to me how humble you are with all the amazing things you've done. And thank you for being my first podcast interviewee. I, I loved it. And I hopefully we'll get to I enjoyed it too, Leslie. I could talk to you for hours, so hopefully we'll get to do another one. Okay. Thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 85 of Dermatology Weekly. I'm your host, Nick Andrews. Dermatology Weekly is produced by MDH editors Elizabeth Meshkati and Melissa Sears. I'm your audio engineer and audio editor. All MDH podcasts are produced by executive editor Kathy Scarbeck and the senior vice president of Medscape, Dr. Ivan Aransky. You're listening to Derm Weekly.